I've been meaning to get this down for a while. I definitely have more research to do before I can write anything serious about it, but this is kind of just like a preliminary sketch of an idea that's been beaning around in my head for a while. And it kind of started with, you know, just watching on social media and people would sort of joke like, you know, oh, I have to go to work because of capitalism or, you know, oh, we see there your problem, it's capitalism kind of thing. And I, I, I guess the, the, I found it grating because it was so defeatist. And it occurred to me, like, what if it was already over? Like, what if, you know, capitalism died of natural causes at some time in the late 20th century? Exactly when we can get into the details of, it's debatable. And what we're currently living in is something else that's very similar looking, but operates according to a, a different logic. Why I think a narrative like this is useful is because, first of all, to the, you know, the, the leftists who um, shout all day about how capitalism is terrible, you can say, well, you know, this is actually something else now. And for the people who like it, who like capitalism, you can say, well, we're not even in capitalism anymore. It's, it's over. What we have is something else, and this is what it is. So to one side, you say, this isn't capitalism anymore. It's actually worse. And the other, you say, this isn't capitalism anymore. It's actually fake. It's not real. It's pretend. And maybe you can get some alignment on both sides of the, the issue of, of capitalism and potentially even do something about it. And now, I just want to preface that I have closely read Smith, but my exposure to Marx is a secondhand osmosis through a bunch of other texts. I was actually going to read Capital um, recently, but I found out that there's a new translation uh, on its way out actually next month, so I put it off. Um, but I still want to get this down. And the idea that societal epochs have shifted, you know, without being noticed, you don't really notice until you're, you know, it's well into the rearview mirror. I think there's a there's precedent for that. And so I just want to sort of outline like what I think the basis for this might be and what it, what it, what it actually is instead. So... One of the things that really stuck out to me in Smith is one of the things that he was arguing for, and aside from uh, you shouldn't intervene, trying to help out your buddies uh, with drawbacks and you know, special sweetheart deals and whatever, was that you shouldn't have to ask permission to better your situation in life. You should be able to be free to use your own industry, your own initiative, and your own you know, ingenuity to become well off. Now, I, I'm sympathetic to that in principle. And so this was in the late 18th century. It actually, it was 1776, uh, weirdly coincidentally. And, um, you know, Industrial Revolution happens, you know, another chunk of a century happens and then Marx gets to writing. So there's like, you know, just shy of a, you know, of a, of a century between Smith and Marx. And, um, you know, so this doctrine has had a chance to sort of play out for, for a while. And what is interesting to me comes not from that writing, but later writing by Alfred Chandler where it's kind of, and I mean, there's a problem, there's problems with that book, like, did he even write it kind of thing? Uh, it's called The Visible Hand, and it's about management. It's about professional management. And he remarks that cost accounting did not exist until, like, the late 19th century, 1890, something like that. And I thought that was really interesting because it sort of jives with an intuition about, you know, about capitalists, that the, the people that own stuff, 
is that they don't actually really care about the metrics exactly. They just care that they're richer today than they were yesterday. Unless, of course, you give them a reason to. Obviously, because more is better, that's a sort of a metric by which you can compare. Now, who is interested in metrics are managers. And, you know, when you go to a, like a, a, another book, uh, The Organization Man by uh, William White, I think that he wrote that in 1954, 54, 56, something like that. He was lamenting the proliferation of professional managers. And there would have been several generations of, of professional managers at that point, um, given that uh, I believe it was Frederick Taylor that uh, uh, that sort of kicked that off with uh, the first management school. Now, there's another book by Joe Guldy called Roads to Power that talks about how management is descended from civil engineering, which is de descended from military engineering. Now, that is only the sort of Anglosphere tradition. There's also a, a, a tradition. There's a Chinese tradition, obviously, the... the, the, the um, officials uh, and, the, and the sort of the Mandarin uh, um, exam system. So that's a whole thing that goes back thousands of years. And then there's also the, the continental European tradition, which is more about uh, government administration, you know, echo, uh, normal, superior, that kind of stuff, science po. And then the Germans, I can't remember. But um, the sort of idea that, you know, 150, 50 years ago, like you didn't have, you know, a COO. You, if you were the boss, you would just have like your right hand man. And it took, um, you know, basically the argument is, is that the bulk of the biomass now is, is professional managers. And they, you know, pay themselves in equity now. And they, um, you know, and they've got the golden parachutes and so on and so forth. So, and again, like a manager is always trying to impress the shareholders, the owners. And, you know, so, so the sort of obsession with metrics, the obsession with, with number go up is more of a manager thing than a capitalist thing, I, I think. And the, actually, um, John Ralston Saul has a of a great line uh, in an interview from, oh God, well over a decade ago, where he's, he talks about how professional managers are, are, well, he calls them managers in drag, in, in capitalist drag, necessarily. And I think that's actually accurate. I think that, that nowadays, so much of our economic system is, is actually overrun by, by managers using a logic of trying to impress some imaginary shareholder. And so the sort of obsession, you know, when you hear this kind of, you know, I think there's even like one of the Charlie Brown uh, uh, specials where, you know, he makes a remark about, I think it was, you know, Christmas is becoming too commercial or something like that. And that's, that would have been in the early 60s. So, I mean, it's been happening for a while, but what's changed, what's new, or at least new as of, I mean, depending on where you want to count, like the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, different events sort of happen. Like, I don't think you can really point to exactly one. But, you know, like even things like, um, you know, Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, uh, turning from a, an LP to a, a uh, you know, to a, to a, a corporation, uh, just as a, for example, and, and, and then a bunch of the other banks following. And, you know, and, and then the people, you know, the, the, the people at the top you know, paying themselves gigantic uh, equity packages and whatnot. And that to me is not the same thing as, you know, putting your own stuff at risk. That's a more like a who moved my cheese kind of scenario where you're, you know, kind of going into the system expecting these kinds of things. And then you get to call yourself a capitalist, but really you've kind of done an end run around it. Anyway, gonna finish my coffee.